Hi, this is Dr. Barnes. Uh, we're getting ready to do another one of our weekly videos. This video is called Understanding Family Healing the Five R's. And the, the five R's are um, sort of organizing principles that families um, use to create what's normal. And so, so often I hear families say, and we've talked about this before, if my loved one would only get sober, we would go back to normal. And, um, you know, I, I th that really what we're going to talk about is, and, and we've talked about it already, the idea of through the process of the addiction, the family has made kind of tweaks and changes and adjustments and, and every attempt to um, cope and to assist their loved one to get better. And uh, over the course of time, they've gone from that original normal uh, to a new normal, and the new normal is really more uh, an accommodation to the act of use. And so, um, as I quote uh, from my website, the longer an individual and their family live with active addiction and trauma, a new normal has already started to form. There is no uh, going back to normal, there is only going forward to creating a newer normal. Therefore, successful therapy is built on a foundation of client and family acceptance, hope and honesty, and the willingness to engage in difficult conversations. And I think, I don't think I can say anything more important in this, this whole program other than um, family healing is really predicated on the major players in that family being willing to say, we recognize that more of the same always results in more of the same. And we're going to start having those difficult conversations that in the past maybe we haven't because of people being angry or people reacting or the loved one storming out of the house or, um, you know, being aggressive in some way. And so, you know, in our Wednesday evening um, multi-family group and in our Sunday discussion I think it's really important for us to talk about what are the uh, obstacles to engaging in difficult conversations and that's why we built from looking at the chronic disease model to looking at trauma to looking at how family members can become traumatized and the idea of really helping to set up uh, the insight and the understanding of the trauma response and the stress response or threat response um, that stops us from having these very difficult conversations. And then the last part that I, you know, this is just my sort of mission statement um, for my practice is that healing occurs when individuals and their family members can move beyond the thoughts, feelings, beliefs, and behaviors that maintain the problem and begin to engage in new thoughts, feelings, beliefs, and behaviors that promote healing. And you, uh, if you were in attendance um, this morning when we did our kind of lecture discussion meeting, uh, we were talking about, um, so what do we do? And um, one of the questions that I had asked was, well, what does your loved one expect you to do? What does your loved one think that you're going to do um, whenever they relapse? What do they think you're going to do whenever they um, react with anger and um, you know, storm out of the house? And this idea of, um, you know, again, more of the same always results in more of the same. So um, the reason that we're spending as much time as we are on helping you to begin to recognize the thoughts and feelings, beliefs, perceptions. We're gonna talk about a lot about perceptions in this video, and behaviors that kind of keep the problem going. And so even with our best efforts to solve the problem, um, if we continue to use the same um, methods of coping, methods of, um, you know, um, enabling, uh, you know, enmeshment, over-involvement, those kinds of things, the more the problem just gets more and more entrenched. And so again, uh, there's no blame, no shame. There's just this roadmap that we're going to talk about. And so when we really think about normal, where does normal come from? Parents come together 
you know, how do new families kind of create the normal for their own families? Um, you can see that uh, I've included in each of these individuals the limbic system, which is what um, um, the brain um, uses to manage stress and threat. A little thing called the amygdala right here. Um, and that, that both of these individuals came from their own families of origin. And uh, the more threatening, the more, um, again, addiction, mental health, those kinds of issues that the brain is um, impacted to a degree to where this person may be much more uh, in um, hypervigilance and control. This person who grew, maybe, maybe grew up in a family without a lot of trauma or addiction doesn't have. So they have very different ways of kind of what is normal in terms of vigilance, managing the behavior of the kids, kind of managing uh, the household, those kinds of things. I've also included in this picture these yellow nerves here. That's called the ventral vagus nerve. And that's what we use in our efforts as children for attachment. And so, uh, again, this is what's going to influence um, our ability to see the world as safe or unsafe. And so, um, I would ask you to kind of think about these questions. And so let me, before I do that, let me go to, um, I've also kind of in, uh, shown that each of these individuals came from a family that had its own genogram, that had its own, its own history. And there is some research that would say that if this family had very little addiction or mental health issues, and this family had a lot, that um, they would have different ways of communicating. They would have different boundaries. They would have different um, autonomy for the, the kids, um, kind of life cycle stages where maybe, they ha uh, maybe this family, the children have more freedom and more um, ability to interact in their world in a way that children in a family with a lot of addiction would not. And so, um, there is research that would say that if these two people come together and this one came from a family with very little addiction and this one came from a family of significant history of addiction and, and we were talking about this today, that idea of is it genetics, is it, is it nature or is it nurture but that the way these two come together to talk about the rules and parenting practices and openness and um, level of monitoring, if it looks more like the family with less addiction, then their kids are less likely to develop their own addiction. If it looks like the family that had significant addiction, that the children are far more likely to become addicted. So, uh, again, I, I would ask you to say, um, you know, what was it like growing up in your family of origin? Um, what was normal there? is probably what you and um, your partner, or if you're a step, uh, step parent, um, the, the, the father and mother, if they were both present, or the, in some cases uh, with adoption, you know, um, multiple fathers, multiple mothers, those kinds of scenarios uh, with very mixed families or blended families. But that at some point along the line, there is an established set of rules, and we'll talk about those in, in a minute, and roles that each person plays, and rituals, and rituals are how do we identify as a family, how do we celebrate being a family. For many families, those are religious, having grown up Catholic, the, the church was so much a part of our lives, we lived a block from the church, um, the religious holidays, and those kinds of things, and there's research that says that the more the addiction in the, 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 the family, the current family and the, the previous family, disrupted those rituals, um, that the more likely the children are also to have um, a higher uh, rate of, of addiction. So we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Routines, how does everyone know what they're supposed to do every day? And, and I'll show you a slide in a few minutes that will really kind of 
ask you some questions about each of these areas that I think are really part of the healing process. And then the last is relationships and boundaries. And so those are negotiated because clearly every family's going to be a little different. So this person probably thinks that their rules, rules, rituals, routines in relationships were either really good or really bad. And same with this person. And when they get together, they begin to negotiate, how are we going to do this? And so that becomes the original normal. And in some cases, they're going to look very much like family of origin. In some cases, they're going to not look at all like that. But whatever it is that kind of begins that process, um, that becomes the normal that most people kind of talk about. Well, boy, if they get sober, we could go back to normal. And uh, we'll kind of um, show again how that um, dis disruption in the process uh, makes that really hard. <clears throat> a guy by the name of Roland uh, is a, a researcher who studies chronic disease and um, he doesn't necessarily study addiction but he studies chronic disease in families and how it impacts families um, of how how they cope and how they live with a chronic disease and um, what he says is that Again, that, that sort of normal that is created in the three-generation assessment, if we were to really look at you know, the, the current family, the, the parents of the parents, and then the great-grandparents, uh, or the grandparents' parents and sort of children, uh, however you would look at your three-generation assessment, that this is where your normal, this is where your uh, um, values and your goals and everyone knowing where they're headed and what they're doing and um, what is acceptable and what's not acceptable. Um, again, religion and things like that. Um, and so, if we don't have a chronic disease in our family, then these evolve over time based on um, the, the movement of children in and out of the family. Like having kids alters um, how those five R's function, kids leaving the family, going off to college, or um, getting married, those kinds of things, or partnering um, um, plays into that. So that these kind of, the, the kind of normal process, uh, or the process of creating a normal uh, belief system, um, becomes what we call proceduralized, that we don't think about it very much. We just make adjustments as we're going. And so, if there is a health issue that is um, um, experienced by the family, or if there were health issues in prior generations, then um, there, um, w what is created, or what we call uh, kind of health-associated or illness belief systems or health schemas, there's a bunch of different words we would use, but this is the the belief about how we as a family are going to deal with things like um, you know any of the chronic diseases you know um, mental illness is a chronic disease addiction is a chronic disease um, uh, you know things like Huntington's disease and other other kinds of uh, genetic uh, diseases so um, what Roland would say is that these beliefs about um, health and asking for help and um, you know the flexibility needed to have someone that we love um, that's really struggling is driven primarily by the generations before us and that um, you know again if we grew up in a family where there was no medical crises then we would probably have very limited belief systems other than this doesn't happen to our family or those kinds of beliefs of, of disbelief when something uh, bad were to happen or an illness were to be diagnosed and that um, these belief systems and schemas um, influence those five R's, the rules and roles, routines, uh, you know, relationships, etc. Um, they can uh, but they may not influence those life cycle stages and um, I'll show you the life cycle stages in the next slide 
and then that impacts how each individual develops a, as a person in terms of um, you know, attachment, um, emotional um, maturity, um, problem solving, um, autonomy, living in the world, partnering, those kinds of things. And so one of the reasons that we're having this conversation is because I want you to be able to look at it's not just the addiction or the trauma that your loved one is experiencing um, and it's not just the experience of addiction or trauma that uh, you may have experienced or your previous generation may have experienced but it's the attempt to kind of create healthy organization and to make sure that everyone is able to get through and do the things that they want to do and to develop healthy needs. You know, one of the things that we say all the time is that um, individuals stop growing developmentally when they start using. And so if your loved one started uh, smoking pot at age 15, prefrontal cortex is not very well developed. Um, there's a lot of things that are supposed to happen in those later teen years in terms of relationships and being able to work autonomously and being able to be goal-driven and value-driven that um, a lot of times people of that young age get sober and realize I have no idea how to do those things and so um, recovery may be really hard for them because they're seeing other people their age who may be emotionally and relationally and developmentally pretty significantly ahead of them, which then may stimulate parents to be more um, enmeshed, more controlling, more caretaking, those kinds of things. But also the fact that these are all the symptoms that um, you and your family are dealing with, not on a constant basis, but on a relatively ongoing basis. You know, some medical emergencies, uh, you know, avoidance of um, you know, we would just like this to go away. Mental and physical abuse, fear and terror. Some people get arrested, automobile accidents, um, overdose, you know, anger and rage, anxiety, uh, a sense of betrayal. And so that each person in the family is emotionally, and from a neuroscience perspective, adjusting to all of these factors. So we were talking the other day about siblings and how sometimes siblings um, can be really resentful of the, of the client and that um, oftentimes siblings are upset because they were not able, because of the addiction of a loved one, um, to, to move you know, kind of through to what they needed to do. And so um, when we talk about life cycle stages, these, uh, Carter and McGoldrick identified these, and it basically says, um, um, and these are somewhat dated with terms like newly married, but newly newly partnered, or uh, might be the, the, the better way, not might be, but clearly the better way. But, you know, we move from being unattached adults to partnered adults. Uh, for some families, it's into childbearing or uh, adopting or... Um, this is kind of family creating, uh, making adjustments um, to being partnered, uh, the changes in parenting roles, um, you know, having kids in the preschool ages, school ages, teenagers, um, the kind of launching pad into college, etc. And so the theory would be, um, number one, it's important for families to recognize where are we on this um, um, life cycle kind of process and where a lot of families with young uh, young addicted individuals really fall is that they're in that sort of um, kind of either later launching pad or kind of uh, you know expecting the kids to be gone and we're on to our own lives and we're on to the sort of um, rebuilding our relationships and you know having partnered kids and grandkids and those kinds of things. And how many families in these stages still have um, a young adult client who you're still treating like a child or you're still treating like a teenager. And so 
um, the theory would be that if if families are not able to move through these stages, that it creates a lot of conflict, it creates a lot of relational conflict and conflict between the partners. Um, for individuals uh, in, in the group that have a partner who is the addicted person, and say so you may be in childbearing phase, and um, that takes a lot of co-parenting and a lot of uh, working with um, you know, the changes that are res required with doctor's appointments and two job families and those kinds of things and that the addiction can begin to create significant problems in these ages um, and particularly if you know kids emotional states are being impacted by the addiction so I mean again um, you know we have expectations about how we're going to move through these stages and it's really important to take a look at where should we be in this and are we able to move into these um, stages or to move through them as is appropriate? And so, um, again, we're, we're kind of looking at family healing basically means that each person, and the last slide will tie all of this together, but family healing means that each person in the family gets to kind of go where they're supposed to go and that the family begins to heal, allowing that autonomy for everyone, rather than everyone still focused on, on the um, addicted family member. So we looked at this slide the other day, and um, it's slightly different, I added a piece, but this is, this is um, what's called the, the ABCX model of family stress. And what it basically says, and this was Reuben Hill, that's 1949, not 1904. Um, so, what, what, and this was from my dissertation on the secondary trauma of parents, but the idea of um, the family's perception of the problem, the stressors, which are driven either by um, these health schemas, or by how previous generations managed these problems, or by the rules that they had to live in with their family of origin, things like that. But that the, the perception of the problem is what dictates the resources that we will allow ourselves to use. So events happen, we process from a perception standpoint, we assess what the resources that we have available to us are. These impact um, how we communicate with one another and the success or failure of working through um, this process, this little triangle here, uh, will dictate the level of crisis or stress because um, the expectation is that if our perception, we understand what the problem is, we have the resources to solve it, we communicate work as a family to solve it, that that stressor will go away and we will go back to normal. But for many families, and uh, this is a quote from Sean Holliday, that's Halliday that says, the crisis is not the problem. That for many families, it's their beliefs, their constraining beliefs uh, about an understanding of what the problem is that restrict alternative views about the crisis that now become the problem. And so, um, to a very large degree, family healing cannot start without this issue of um, our understanding of the problem being different. We've talked about that multiple times. And this is um, a slide that will really begin to talk about, you know, where does our perception come from? Again, we're going to go back to family of origin, uh, our, you know, our own personal trauma history adverse childhood events that we've experienced, adverse childhood ex events that our kids have experienced, and how that impacts us um, in our kind of day-to-day -day ability to tolerate anxiety and to tolerate threat. Uh, personal addiction history, cultural influences, everything from sort of race and racial trauma, religion, religious trauma, uh, gender, gender-related uh, uh, traumas, class, etc relationship history, marital status, um, you know, grief and loss issues with maybe a lost partner, um, 
divorce, um, never finding a, a person being, um, you know, whatever uh, the relationship status is. And then the current relationship with extended family, is this something we can talk about? Is this something that stays as a secret? And so, uh, again, this perception is, is critical because our resources are, you know, you know, how much emotional intelligence do we have? Um, how much um, intellect and ability to con uh, solve complex problems? What is our attachment style? Is everyone anxious? Uh, are people avoidant? Are people able to regulate their autonomic nervous system? Or as we're trying to have those difficult conversations that I talk about, um, are they kind of um, failing to use resources that they even have available to them uh, to be able to solve the problem? Uh, financial security, insurance, you know, counseling, those kinds of things. And, and the stressors can be any number of things, from developmental transitions, as we're, you know, there's, there's a lot of stress as um, we have um, kids changing schools or moving into teen years, uh, launching, going off to college, uh, being able to afford college and those kinds of things. So, um, you know, developmental transitions, us moving in, you know, into retirement, us, us moving into, um, you know, alone time after all the, these years with kids and things like that. Addiction, trauma, illness, employment changes, unemployment, particularly now, think about with COVID. How many people are struggling financially? Uh, legal issues, relationship issues. So these, when we start putting all of this together and we go back to this model that if our perception is really limited to um, a very inflexible way of managing a stressor, uh, regardless of the resources that we have available to us, communication is probably going to be conflicted and is probably going to be um, unsuccessful in solving that problem. And so when most clients come to us, so I include, I include this slide to just show the, the progression of the illness and again how um, uh, you know, um, perception is going to change and, and uh, rules are going to change and that organization and how the family functions on a daily basis will will change as the addiction goes from being kind of a minor uncertainty to being problematic to being a crisis. And so again, um, as this person is moving in the progression of their illness, this family is trying everything possible within the, f the limitations of their understanding of the problem to solve that for them. And so here's where most families are when they get to us. So if this is the ABCX model with the idea that perception and resources are kind of assessed and how we're going to address the problem, if we're unsuccessful in solving the problem, then we have in family stress theory, that's called a crisis. A problem is basically anything that forces us to activate this triangle uh, to solve a problem and in most cases we solve it using our current rules and roles and routines and, and our existing resources and so if in the case of a, of a major trauma or in the case of a significant addiction um, if we don't have a perception of that maybe our perception is based on addiction in prior generations. Maybe our perception is based on the fact that we have no idea what to do because we've never experienced anything like that. But that either way, if this person continues to use or this person continues to have significant consequences as a result of their trauma, that the family goes into a state of crisis. And crisis basically means that we are going to continue to attempt to solve this problem, but we have to also engage in taking, you know, and living as a family. And so what we begin to see is, the first thing is that this stressor, now the family experiences what we call pile-up stressors. 
and pile-up stressors are legal problems associated with this person's addiction. Um, marital conflict from uh, failed uh, attempts to help the person stay sober. Conflict between kids. Um, uh, other kids not moving through the life cycle stages as appropriately. The family, the, the, the relational couple not moving forward with their life goals because they're now um, spending all their time trying to figure out what to do with, you know, how do we solve this problem for our loved one. And so, <coughs> if the problem could have been solved back here, that there clearly are a lot less of these pile-up stressors. The faster that, and on this timeline, that this can be solved, that sobriety happens, the less these pile-up stressors happen. But, um, you know, depending on how long the family has been trying to both live as a family and make sure everyone gets everything that they need, plus dealing with the consequences of the, the, the crisis at hand, you know, perception is now getting, in most cases, more and more rigid and less flexible. We don't try new things, we try the same things harder. Um, you know, my, you know, people, like I said, people always ask me what they should do and how they should do it. And, when I tell them, they usually tell me why it won't work and how they've already tried that. And so, you know, that idea of how do we help you begin to change your perception about what is possible. And, um, you know, I tell families a lot. They'll, they'll come in and they are looking for an answer that will explain everything away and um, it kind of makes it clean and somewhat easy fix at that point. And um, oftentimes, you know, in treatment, we don't see that. And so to say to a family, well, what if you're wrong? What if this hypothesis that you've developed from previous trauma or previous uh, family history of addiction or mental health or whatever that has been driving the coping mechanisms, what if those are wrong? And, um, you know, that's up to everyone to decide. But that idea of, if we can help you change this, while we help you, be, you know, begin to look at the resources that you still have remaining, a lot of families are exhausted by the time they get here. And so, um, you know, that's one of the things that we're going to want to talk about on Wednesday and Thursday, um, or Wednesday and, and Sunday of this coming week is um, put this slide up and begin to talk about how have perceptions changed, how have resources changed. And then the idea that while this is happening, all of the rules and the roles and the routines and the balance that this family is trying to maintain begins to shift. People get closer, which causes a, a change in balance. Uh, people leave the family which creates a change in uh, homeostasis or balance. And so for family healing, you know, it's really about stepping back and looking at where are we right now without um, blame, without resentment, and to begin to look at some, um, some solutions. So, so when I talk about the five R's, these are the things that I that um, in, in my reading of, uh, this, it's an older book, but it was a good book called The Alcoholic Family uh, by Peter Steinglass and a variety of people at George Washington University and um, some work that some colleagues of mine at Florida State, they were professors of mine, did where they really began to look at family stress. And they talked about rules, and rules are, uh, um, you know, we say it all the time, it's, we have to make the covert over. And that what we see is over time, as the, as the crisis is trying to be managed, that the families create a lot of covert rules, that there becomes a lot of secrets. People in coalitions, people talking about their loved one and the addiction. Siblings being angry and talking to mom and dad about their loved one's addiction. Um, 
you know, wives or, or partners um, um, going around behind the addicted person's back in order to get social support. And so keeping secrets from that person. Communication becomes really limited. The term meta-communication basically means the idea of what, what do we communicate when we don't think we're communicating. As a marriage counselor, people used to come to me a lot and they would say, well, I'd say, why are you here? And they would say, well, we just don't communicate. And in family therapy, we're of the opinion, particularly systems-oriented uh, therapists, that we can never not communicate. That, our, that behavior is communication. And so, um, while even while families are not talking to each other, how they interact send covert messages, or send um, you know double binding messages where it kind of traps family members into certain reactions. Um, families tend to become more enmeshed, basically meaning that it's hard for the kids in that family to establish a sense of autonomy. Um, because a lot of times younger kids are uh, per, uh, brought up into parental decisions and uh, kind of moving over into role, roles. But this idea of um, rules become more about like don't talk about things, don't share your feelings, um, be careful trusting, um, safety first, and that, that may mean emotional safety. Um, I was writing in my book uh, on my book the other day and um, w one of the things I was writing about was the double bind that happens in families where you know your parents love you but they're constantly shaping behavior with these unconscious and, um, um, and good intended well intended messages and I wrote something to the effect of um, there can only be so many um, kind of like death stares and um, kindly pointing out your mistakes and your um, shortcomings before the client, before the individual, the kid, the young person in the family begins to focus much more on how do I stay safe than I do on the care and love of the people around me. And I think that's a really common symptom of developmental trauma, and it's a really common response in families. And that idea of a glance, a look, learning how to read people's faces, um, the idea that your uh, worth is much more predicated on how others see you, those kinds of things are very common in these families. Rules, uh, decision-making, parenting, caregiving, uh, patriarch, matriarch, who's in charge of certain activities, paying bills, um, primary breadwinners, those kinds of things, uh, two income earners, and that as one person begins to deteriorate down the rabbit hole of addiction, the other person probably has to take on double duty. And oftentimes, uh, the kids uh, have to begin to take on adult responsibilities. We, ca we call them parentified children. And the idea... <clears throat> Uh, once parentified, once they believe that they have an important role to play in the maintenance of this family, um, they are. it is very hard to get them to accept the responsibility that their role is to be a child or their role is to be a teenager because there's really important developmental processes that go in those areas. So many kids become very independent and family heroes and the next thing you know, they're, um, they're gone. Um, uh, routines, what are the daily activities? Um, picking up kids at daycare, um, getting groceries, um, and how those daily routines get altered in order to cope with an actively using addicted family member. And how um, you know, uh, the hypervigilance that is required uh, on the part of parents. And then um, uh, rituals, celebrations, we've already talked about those. Um, my, my grandfather um, would get drunk at Christmas and ruin everything. He'd knock the Christmas tree over or something along those lines. And my mother had this real significant love-hate relationship with Christmas where she really wanted us to have great 
um, Christmas holidays, but she was also very anxious throughout that whole process. And so um, how does family history either accentuate and, and maximize benefit from these uh, wonderful celebrations? Um, and for some families, they just stop having them because um, they, they always get ruined. And again, there is research that says that the, the more disruption kids experience in terms of these uh, rituals, these celebrations and being special, the more likely they are to seek out drugs and alcohol as a coping strategy. And then the last one is boundaries. That what we find is that um, you know, family boundaries get really rigid and really closed. Um, there's a lot more um, enmeshment between the various subsystems in the family. And there are th generally three subsystems in the family. There are the, the relationship, parental relationship, or adult relationships um, that the kids are not supposed to be a part of. There's parental relationships or, or step-parent relationships that are negotiated and that um, each kid has a different relationship that's slightly with each of the adult in the family and then the 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 sibling subsystem um, whether it's siblings or, or step siblings um, that that um, the more addiction the more trauma the more problems in that family the more those systems uh, act in ways that are not um, age appropriate developmentally appropriate um, those kinds of things and so if you're thinking well I don't know what this looks like and so, just think of this scenario and how no one told this kid what to do, but this kid clearly understood what, um, from an emotional level, she needed to do. And so we call it recursive, that if this is the addict in the family and they walk in the door and they're trashed and, and how simple, how easily, even when people say, uh, I am going to not start a fight tonight, or I'm gonna. We're gonna just get through this as best we can. So, person walks in the door. They're intoxicated. Um, they're kind of frustrated, defensive. They're kind of looking uh, for judgment. And person number one, the person who just walked in, sees family member number two, maybe their partner, uh, who has seen this many times before, and before they even think about it. They respond with a look of disdain. Didn't say anything, but boy, they communicated. He did it again. And so now, again, neither person has said a word to each other, but they have communicated to each other where they are in this scenario. And then person number one and person number two engage in an argument uh, about number one's state of intoxication they get loud and they start threatening or, or, or arguing. And <clears throat> if not interrupted, um, you know, it's hard to tell where that argument is going to go. In many cases, it just may end by, um, you know, both people stay, saying their thoughts and that one goes to one room, one goes to the other room. But in some cases, it may turn into a much more heated argument. One of the kids hears this argument, watches the interaction, becomes fearful because of the history, uh, for the safety of the second person, their, maybe the, one of their parents, and joins in the argument to defend number two. We see it all the time, where kids stick up for one or the other of the family members. Well, once this child steps into this role, one and two generally stop arguing and tell number the, the child that it's okay. Go back to your room. We're, we're, we're going to be fine. Um, the kid is upset. And then um, number one goes to his room while number two pays attention into comforting the child. And so you might think, well, what's, what's the pattern? So what do you think this child is learning in that process. One of the things that child is learning is that um, these two, these two adults here, they'll never figure this out. It's dangerous. It, this is scary. 
and I'm afraid that mom is going to get hurt. Uh, I had a client once that um, the kids would go to bed when dad would come home drunk, and he and mom would just yell and scream at each other. And then he would say, I'm out of here, and he would go drink. And mother would start throwing pots and pans around in the kitchen, which, if you were to ask her why she's doing that, she would say she's upset. But if you ask the kids why she did that, they would say that was her signal that she wanted us to come and comfort her. And so this idea that the rules begin to evolve as time goes on. And so um, is it likely that this child, I think today we were talking today about the different roles and I was talking about the mascot in the family and the mascot is the person who can sense the anxiety and either tell the joke or do something to get the attention off of the fight and on to them. And so does this person um, grow up to be a therapist? <laughs> does this person grow up to date people um, um, who are needy? Um, is this person uh, grow up to be um, um, only able to tolerate a complete non-anxious presence? And so you begin to look and see how this unspoken, undiscussed rule begins to change to where this child becomes responsible on some level to stop these arguments. Um, and so um, we talk about the amygdala, that part of the limbic system that is always assessing for danger. And I'm of the opinion that one of these people are always the, the sort of functional amygdala for the family. And so the amygdala for this family is the kid. And the kid um, who um, acts emotionally but also um, becomes the sort of parent figure in, in stopping this process. So I would, you know, I, I hope that makes sense to you, but I, I, I'll bet if you could step back and look at how your family has reacted, that you would find, you know, lots of these little recursive processes that create the new normal, that this is how the family and the, the mobile begins to act differently as the person's symptoms progress. So normal, new normal, recovery is new normal. So when you're together, you know, you have, we have the marbles, um, we have family history, we all have an amygdala, we all have a limbic system that is reacting out of threat. And as we have anger and anxiety and enabling and conflict, what we do is we create a new normal. We create a system that allows people to maintain their marbles in the appropriate place, or that certain members create that system where the, the marble stays right here in the high stress state, um, where others are dissociated, and so as, you're, as we're starting the discussion of family healing, it's not just making changes. But today we talked about uh, neuroscience and brain plasticity and the idea that if, if this family thinks that this person is going to get sober, given what we know about the biology and the environment and the epigenetics of this process, without all of them be, being able to manage or to make progress in understanding all of the factors that keep them stuck, it's, it's um, probably pretty unlikely. So this is really, as you, we begin the healing process, that I want you to think about. If this is you, or this is you, you know, where are your marbles? Meaning, where are you in terms of managing your stress? Um, where, what role is your own history playing in how those marbles roll up or down? You know, how traumatized are you? How stressed are you in terms of being able? Remember that as that marble moves up, uh, up into this higher stress response, um, the prefrontal cortex goes offline. 
and all the information and all the love and all the caring and all the things that we want to say uh, are harder to access at that point. And so when we talk on Wednesday to really begin to look at what are some tools to keep that um, kind of in line. So uh, you probably cannot read this, but I hope you can. This is an assessment that, um, you know, if you go into the second phase of, of our program, our family program, um, we're going to, this is an exercise that we will do. And, um, and it's really just a little questionnaire for you to look at, like, where did your family values come from? And what are your values? And um, I have a really good values exercise because when I ask people that, they can usually say one or two. You know, hard work, um, Christian values, um, education was really important in our family, um, you know, service. So, but, but there are so many different things that we value, um, some of which are really health, healthy and helpful and others not so. It, but it is our values that drive how we try to meet them through these others. Rules, the rules that we live by. Um, are family rules uh, about communication overt or covert? Is this a family where um, people are empowered to say what they think even though it may not be popular? Are people able to communicate emotions? Um, even though it may make others uncomfortable. Um, do you talk? I had this mother call me once and she said, I'm really upset with you all. Um, our son thinks we're keeping secrets from him. And I said, are you? And she said, well, yeah, but, you know, we're, we're trying to keep them secret. And it's like, oh, hold it a second. Like, let's talk about that. But that idea of even in recovery, are people still talking behind the person's back, um, trying not to irritate them, trying not to hurt them, not, trying not to trigger them. And then once they find that out, they realize that I'm being treated the same way I was being treated when I was using. How do secrets uh, get tolerated? Are they supported? Uh, are family members permitted to express concerns and complaints? How do you deal with deviation from these rules? Um, how does what does punishment look like? Um, what does corrective action look like? Um, have the rules or enforcement of rules changed as the addiction has gotten worse or as the trauma has um, gotten worse? Um, what new rules do you want to develop? So these are just things that we would be talking about and that I think are really part of that healing process. The same with roles. Is there a clear delineation in terms of who's responsible for certain rules? Parenting responsibilities, decision making, etc. Do people know? Are family members asked to be responsible for things that they're not typically uh, their responsibility? Are kids asked to do things that are sometimes very necessary, but um, they're above the pay grade of that person? Do family members take on roles that everyone knows but no one talks about that idea of the oldest kid is often uh, with a, an addicted parent um, a quasi parental figure for the younger siblings and oftentimes it's not talked about but it's it's what's needed in order to survive um, relationships um, have relationships changed between you and other family members uh, are there uh, family members who feel like insiders maybe the parentified kid, um, and others who feel uh, really excluded or outsiders. Has your family interactions with systems outside of the family been different? School, work, social services, uh, those kinds of things. Um, are kids allowed to bring other fr their friends home? Uh, are kids allowed to get help um, you know, outside of the family? There's a lot of things that we can talk about there. Uh, daily routines. Um, is there a structure to what's expected of family members in terms of uh, daily routines and responsibilities? Are there chores? Are people expected to pick up those, uh, for those chores? Um, 
What are they supposed to do after school? Is everyone clear on the expectations for their daily activities? Um, you know, how do you manage when family members don't follow through? Um, you know, again, if we were to be able to look at this, we would probably see all of these shifting to some degree. And, um, <clears throat> and when people say, well, I don't think so, um, if you have a, <clears throat> a teenager who's acting out or a young adult who's acting out, uh, oftentimes um, parents will say, well, someone has to be home when he gets home from school so that we can... And so people start accommodating, changing their work schedules in order to um, try to control the environment, those kinds of things. So there's a lot of different things we can talk about. And the last one is rituals. Um, you know, do you have unique ways to recognize family members for a job well done? Are there religious or cultural holidays? or How do you celebrate what's unique about your family? And so what I would say is to be able to look at those questions and get a sense about where have you been in terms of how these look and what will they look like in the future? Or, or and like how have they changed between the normal to the new normal and then this is the real work for the family is um, how would we like it to be what would it look like um, if uh, we as a family got closer um, if um, you know sobriety um, became a part of our lives and it's not just that one person's life but it's everybody's life how would the family not just you know, the parents or the partners or, or um, the recovering person but this is a negotiated process that um, you know needs to happen throughout time over time and there's two more slides i'm just going to go through them quickly because we'll probably talk about them more again these are the questions that I think are imperative for family healing and again these are these are questions that in our second phase of the program we will start with these and so that idea of um, common questions that I use to stimulate conversation about healing <clears throat> and I would start and I would like to start on Wednesday um, with this for everyone who shows up and that is what is it like for each of you and imagine if your whole family was together in a session to be asked to engage in a process of self-reflection and ownership of how you were impacted by the trauma the rules that you played and how the family coped and how your life has been impacted by not by the addiction but by the family coping strategy in phase two the loved one will be part of the of the process they will be attending every meeting and so it's not going to be sitting and talking about them with them not present it's inviting them back into that family fold that they're going to be talking about and answering the same questions as well so it's really important what's it like for each piece person in this family to be asked to engage in this process and a lot of times families will say well I don't know why I'm here like and particularly siblings. Well, I don't know why I'm here. I don't have anything to do with this. This is between you and him. Well, if everything we've kind of learned is true, that idea of life cycle stages and how does it impact um, the autonomy of the other children, it's really important to have those other siblings be present um, to um, really begin a process of healing. Second question. Um, and again, we probably won't work on some of these other questions until um, the next process, but what will need to happen before all members of the family will become willing to see themselves as a necessary piece of the family healing puzzle? What do we need to do to get buy-in from everybody? Um, and if people are not willing, how, how does the rest of the family feel about that? Um, and it um, you know, uh, the third question, how much anxiety, distrust, resentment, fear, anger needs to be resolved in order for you to begin the process of healing 
and change as a family. And that idea of what are the things that keep the family from being able to have conversations that are open and honest and, and to be able to say, I don't know. I don't know. I don't have, you know, I don't have an answer for this. We need, um, you know, we need to just love each other and, um, and have difficult conversations. How do we meet in the middle on some of these issues? Four, how have you been impacted by addiction, trauma, and the symptoms of both in your own life? Um, so often, um, kids don't really understand their parents' life. Parents don't, and it's appropriate in many ways, um, they don't talk about their own family very much. And so this idea of beginning a process of normalizing that, you know, we've all been impacted uh, in one way or another. And then the last question, how does this experience influence how each family member has coped and um, beginning a dialogue for change in those areas? So. Um, when I say these are, uh, you know, successful therapy is built on um, difficult conversations, these are the questions that um, kind of stimulate that discussion. And then this is the last slide, and I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna say this. I'm gonna do another video uh, on um, resilience and resiliency in families, but. Um, um, one day Annie and I were meeting and I showed her this slide and um, this was by Dr. Figley who was my mentor and she read it and she said this is what our family program is all about like what our, what our entire treatment program is all about and I said it actually is but have you seen this before? She said, no, I've never seen the document, but this is what you have been sort of teaching us about what um, you know, the, the process of therapy is about. And um, so I think it's important as we're winding up this issue on family healing to talk about, you know, what are um, some goals in terms of uh, where uh, families uh, can hopefully begin to shift in terms of res resilience. And the first one is accepting responsibility for dealing with the situation and to mobilizing energy and resources for action. That idea of it's not my fault, it's not, I don't have the problem, and that is the addiction, the, the process that brought you to the foundry has impacted everyone in your family. And if each person can take some responsibility not for the addiction but for the um, willingness to work together to heal that that's the first uh, you know, that shift in perception from it's not my problem to it's all of our problem number two shift focus from any one family member and recognize that it is a problem that the entire family must face so one and two go hand in hand Three, move quickly from a blaming stance to a solution-oriented focus. Um, you know, we spend so much time in the problem um, that we just um, make our perceptions more and more rigid. We um, make our limbic system, our fight-or-flight response, more and more rigid um, rather than um, really begin to own our part in it and ways that we can all change. Number four, family members exhibit increased tolerance and patience for one another. When your loved one gets sober, they're gonna have really bad days. And so you're gonna have bad days. We all have bad days. And that idea of being able to tolerate when someone has a, a meltdown, to be able to tolerate um, people not necessarily following the rules, uh, to tolerate people's emotional state, um, you know, and so often it's um, the minute someone exhibits old behavior that the whole system goes into, you know, fight or flight mode. Like, um, we need to control this. Is You know, are they using or not using? And so that idea of how do we create much more tolerance and patience? 
five, clearly identify and express emotion associated with a traumatic event or with the addiction and verbalize commitment to one another through this, this post-traumatic process. The idea of um, allowing people to be emotional, allowing people to uh, kind of feel uh, what it is. And again, we're trying to expand the range of people emotionally. Six, allow members to access their own individual and interpersonal resources, both internal and external to the family system. And that really means friendships and mentors, coaches, playing sports, doing things outside of the family, teachers, um, therapists, those kinds of things. Seven, reach out for social support with little difficulty or embarrassment. That idea that social support is the number one healing process. So often people will say, I'm not going to Elm on that. That would, that would be mortifying. Um, but the idea of everyone in that room has been through the same thing that you've been through. And so being open to getting that kind of support. And then the last is uh, being able to do it without violence or without addiction. And um, so, you know, those are the things that if you can begin this process, um, number one, everyone in your family will recognize those differences and the healing process will begin at that point. So um, this has, again, been longer than I had anticipated, but um, I think everything is really important. So it's going to set the stage for everything that we do over the next couple weeks. So thank you for hanging in there. And um, um, I'll talk to you on Wednesday. Thanks.